Today's gaming industry owes its existence to the golden age of arcade games. So let's find out where it all started. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. The golden age of video games ran from about 1978 to about 1983 and this saw a massive boost in the development of computer games leading into home computers, consoles and then on to today's machines. There are fantastic games that were developed during that period and don't forget that you can actually play all of them on your own computer and I'll put some links to my tutorials on setting up your computer as an arcade machine down in the description below. And don't forget, if you want to keep up to date with all of my videos, then do make sure you subscribe to my channel and click like on the on bit down below to let YouTube know that I'm making something interesting. So, without any more delay, let's get into the video. So let's start by looking at where computer games came from. Well, computer video games, they've been around since the early 60s, when graphic displays first started appearing on computers. But you have to remember that at this time a computer filled an entire room, it cost around $100,000 which puts it up at about $1 million in today's money and required a team of highly qualified professionals, usually mathematicians and physicists, to get it to work. But even so, programmers found the time and managed to code games such as Space War, which is deemed to be the first ever shoot 'em up game. This ran on a PDP-1 computer, which was a pretty powerful machine at the time, but there were only about 50 of them in existence, so not many people ever got to play this game. Of course, as technology advanced and electronics became less expensive, the first public games started to appear, and this was in the early 1970s. But these games tended to use purpose-built circuits using discrete logic chips rather than actual microprocessors. So they'd be built from individual NAND and AND gates and so on. They were very much seen as novelty products and didn't have the mass appeal that we see today. Now, notable games from this period were Computer Space, which was basically a remake of Space War, which was deemed to be the first electronic arcade game and Pong, which is probably the most successful game of this period, which was a simple machine that simulated a game of tennis, again, completely built using discrete logic chips. But at this time, the gaming industry was exceedingly small. For instance, the game Pong, over its entire lifetime, only sold around 20,000 units. And this was partly due to the limited gameplay of these TTL logic based games, and also the actual cost of manufacturing and owning the machine. But then, in 1978, this all changed with the release of a brand new game called Space Invaders by Taito in Japan. Space Invaders actually was a real game changer, both in what a computer game was and who was playing it. Microprocessors, which are the actual brain of modern day computers, were now becoming available at a reasonable cost. And these allowed game developers much more incredible scope to code games compared to using discrete logic circuits. And Tomohiro Nishikado, I hopefully said that correctly, the inventor and programmer of Space Invaders, he took full advantage of this. The inspiration for Space Invaders was actually a game called Breakout, which was a variation on the original game called Pong, where uh, you had the player had a bat and a ball was bouncing on the screen, and you then had to hit the ball against a number of coloured bricks at the top of the screen, and each time the ball hit a brick, that brick was destroyed. But Tomohiro took that idea and then developed into a truly revolutionary design. So. He allowed the player ship along the bottom of the screen to fire missiles rather than bouncing this ball. He then had the bricks replaced with moving enemy ships. And these enemy ships not only moved, but they were actually able to fire back and try and kill the player as well. 
These aliens then were moving across the screen, and as they moved across the screen, when they hit the edge of the screen, they then moved down. So they gradually moved down the screen in this sort of zigzag pattern. He also added some protective bunkers that the player could hide behind, but these were then gradually destroyed by both the alien missiles hitting them and also the player missiles. He also added a high score counter for the highest score since the machine had been turned on, and that was a first. And he also then added the first continuous background music track to a computer game. Okay, so this was a very simple track with only four um, notes, but it got more and more intense as the level progressed, which helped build up the whole atmosphere behind this game. A lot of this had never been done before, and a lot of it hadn't been done because it hadn't been possible with previous arcade machines. Indeed, the game developer, he rated the design of the hardware as one of the most difficult parts of the project, trying to build a machine that was capable of actually running his game. So combining all of this with the outstanding gameplay, this ensured Space Invaders became an instant success across Japan. As a guide for just how big a success Space Invaders was, if we consider Pong, which was the best-selling game up to that point, which sold around 20,000 units, within the first two years of Space Invaders' launch, it's estimated that around 750,000 units were sold. The success of Space Invaders sparked an explosion of video game production. Every company wanted to emulate the success and the massive profits being pulled in by Space Invader machines. And, as we say, the rest is history. So, let's take a look at some of the biggest and most influential arcade games of the early 1980s which helped launch this golden age of video games. So where better to start than, of course, with Space Invaders itself? As we've already discussed, this was the first blockbuster arcade game that almost single-handedly launched the video game revolution. The basic premise of the game is quite simple. Rows of aliens start at the top of the screen, marching side to side and descending as they reach the edges. The player ship moves along the bottom of the screen, shooting these aliens with missiles. The aliens return fire with their own missiles, trying to hit and kill the player ship. You've got four protective bunkers to cover you, but these gradually get blown away by missile hits. As you shoot more and more aliens, their marching speed increases, and the iconic heartbeat background music gets faster and faster. Each time you clear a grid of aliens, the game restarts with a new set of invaders getting lower and lower. Whilst the graphics of this may seem dated by today's standards, the gameplay is still top notch. At the time, Space Invaders was revolutionary. I vividly remember my big brother taking me to his police station where they had just had a game installed. I'd never seen a computer game before and the graphics, sound and excitement is a memory that will stay with me forever. Almost every computer game since Space Invaders owes at least part of its genesis to this game. And of course, um, don't forget to check out my Coding Space Invaders course where you can code Space Invaders for yourself and learn how to program at the same time. And I'll put links to that in the description below. Space Invaders financial success was also massive, with owners of machines collectively gathering over 2 billion in coin sales, which gave them a profit of over 450 million. And this was the first time that a computer game really compared with blockbuster movies, and it compared with Star Wars, the biggest movie up to that point, which grossed 450 million, with only about 175 million in profit. And of course, these massive profits were a big incentive for lots of other companies to jump on this bandwagon and build their own games. Atari had been developing a few games using vector graphics arcade machines, such as Lunar Lander. But Asteroids, launched in 1979, was an instant hit, becoming the best-selling vector graphics game of all time and Atari's best-selling machi arcade machine. 
Vector graphics machines use the electron beam inside a cathode ray tube to draw lines directly on the screen, forming the game elements. So this allows the game characters to smoothly rotate and fire in any directions, which is something that's very hard to achieve with the more traditional pixel-based graphics. The asteroids game involves a player ship stuck in an asteroid field. It must use its laser cannon to break up the asteroids into smaller and smaller pieces until they finally disintegrate. As the asteroids break up, they become harder to shoot and to avoid. So the player controls consist of a rotate left and rotate right button, a thrust button, a fire button and a hyperspace button. You use the left and right buttons to control the direction the ship is pointing in and the thrust button to increase its velocity in that direction. The game includes a very realistic modelling of the spaceship motion, where once it's moving in a certain direction, it will continue in that direction whilst gradually slowing down. Thrusting in a different direction simply adds velocity in this new direction, causing the ship to fly in curves, rather than simply changing direction to the way it's pointing. So this was one of the first ideas of modelling physics inside a game. As an added hazard, enemy spaceships will appear as each level progresses. These try to shoot you as they move across the screen. If you want to have a go at coding asteroids for yourself, I've produced a course on this available on YouTube here, so have a look at the Learning to Code Asteroids course. Released in 1980 by Namco and designed and coded by Toru Iwatani, Pac-Man is the highest earning game of all time. It was the first character-based game to be released, allowing it to appeal to both men and women, rather than the then predominantly male-focused shoot-em-up games that had taken over since Space Invaders launched. The game is based around Pac-Man, a yellow circle character who was trapped in a maze along with four ghosts. Pac-Man must eat all 240 yellow dots which line the corridors of the maze to progress to the next level. He's continually chased by these four ghosts who will kill him if they catch him. There are four power pills, one in each corner of the maze, and these allow Pac-Man to turn the tables on the ghosts and eat them. After eating a power pill, Pac-Man has a short time when the ghosts turn dark blue for him to catch and eat them. Pac-Man was the first game to introduce cutscenes. After every two or three levels, a short animation is played to give the player both a rest and introduce a bit of humour into the game. Pac-Man was also one of the first games to introduce a form of artificial intelligence for each of the ghosts. Each ghost follows a different algorithm to decide how it chases Pac-Man. So the red ghost, called Blinky, always tries to get to the same position as Pac-Man, and this results in him almost always chasing Pac-Man. The pink ghost, called Pinky, always tries to get to where Pac-Man is going by targeting a place in the maze four steps ahead of Pac-Man. This results in him blocking Pac-Man's escape when being chased by the other ghosts. The blue ghost, called Inky, has a slightly different way of targeting Pac-Man. He uses the position two paces in front of Pac-Man, along with the position of the red ghost Blinky, to create a new target position that he tries to get to. This results in Inky trying to get to the position which Blinky is chasing Pac-Man's toward, again meaning that he will quite often trap Pac-Man. The orange ghost, called Clyde, uses two separate algorithms. When he's far away from Pac-Man, he uses Blinky's, well that's the red ghost's, algorithm to chase uh, Pac-Man and get as close to him as he can. However, once he gets within eight spaces of Pac-Man, he starts returning back to his home corner. Again, once he gets farther than eight spaces away from Pac-Man, he returns to chasing him. So this results in a slightly more random movement pattern, where he's generally hovering around the vicinity of Pac-Man, but not directly targeting him. 
The total sales for Pac-Man units was about 400,000 units, which was less than Space Invaders, but the actual machines brought in, in total, $6 billion in the early 80s, which is worth about $16 billion in today's money. And again, that puts it at the very top of the earnings lead for any arcade machine ever produced. Scramble from Konami was introduced in 1981, and this was the world's first side-scrolling shooter game. It was the first to use what's known as force scrolling, where the game screen continuously moves with the player being forced to carry on going through the map. The game was also one of the first to have distinct levels within the game map, where the player had to overcome different challenges. So in the game, the player flies a jet, which can move vertically, horizontally on the screen, with the ground continually scrolling from right to left. The jet can fire horizontal bullets, as well as dropping bombs, which descend in an arc in front of the player. Enemy targets on the ground include bases, fuel tanks, which replenish your jet's fuel reserve, and missiles, which can launch vertically to shoot you. Each level consists of six sections. In the first section, the jet flies over mountains with scattered bases, fuel tanks and missiles which randomly launch to kill you. In section 2, the player flies through a cave with UFO ships oscillating up and down. These have to be shot or avoided while still bombing ground targets to replenish your fuel supply. Section 3 sees you flying through an asteroid storm where you can't actually shoot and kill the asteroids. You have to avoid them, again, still keeping going and getting your fuel replenished. Section 4 is the city level where the player flies over a cityscape with the usual ground targets and missiles. This is then followed by the treacherous machine tunnel stage, where there's only just enough room to manoeuvre the jet through the passages, and then finally on to the base section, where the jet must attack the enemy base and destroy it. Then it's back to the start, section 1, but faster and harder. Donkey Kong was one of the very first platform games where action takes place on several play levels on the same screen. It followed Pac-Man's lead by featuring a friendly comic character as the player, and he was initially called Jumpman, but obviously in later versions he became the infamous Mario. Again, the novel gameplay, four different game screens, each with very different playing styles, and a constantly hectic gameplay made this one of Nintendo's first big hits. On the first three screens, Mario starts at the bottom and must battle his way to the top of the screen to save the girl. On the way, he has to dodge barrels, fireballs and other objects, whilst making pixel-perfect jumps to overcome various obstacles. On the fourth level, Mario must pull out eight connection bolts holding Donkey Kong's platform. When he manages this, Donkey Kong falls to the ground, defeated and Mario finally gets the girl. Then the whole four levels restart, but faster and more difficult. Incidentally, Mario started life as a carpenter in Donkey Kong, and this is indicated on the arcade machine's flyers. He only changed profession to plumbing when he got to go to Super Mario Brothers in 1983. Atari's pole position, launched in 1982, has a claim to fame of being the first 16-bit video game. It used Namco's new 16-bit arcade cabinet. It's also one of the first games to use a third-person 3D view, and one of the most popular and influential racing games of all time. This third-person view became the norm after pole position, rather than the more usual top-down 2D racing games that had come before it. Personally, I'd have to say that the gameplay is good, if not outstanding, but the 3D effects were amazing for the time. Not true 3D, but a clever use of layering and sprite scaling to give a great impression of a real racing track. 
The system works by dividing the ground between the player and the horizon into horizontal strips. For each strip, the computer works out how far from the player the strip is and they'll calculate which parts of its length should be grass, verge and road. When you then draw the strips, you get the 3D vanishing point effect. Car and sign sprites are then scaled and placed on top of the strip that matches their distance from the player. The arcade machines came in standard upright cabinets and enclosed seated cockpit versions. Each had a full-size steering wheel, a high-low gear shift lever and an accelerator pedal. And the sit-down version, which would look like a, a car cockpit, also had a brake pedal. The game simulates a Formula One style, well at least 1980s version of Formula One, race, with a qualifying lap followed by the race itself. In qualifying, you must get round the track in the allotted time to earn your place on the grid. If you don't qualify, you simply continue driving until your time runs out. If you do qualify, you progress to the race, where you race against seven CPU controlled cars. You must complete each lap within the specified time, and if you manage all four laps, the race ends. Pole Position's 3D third-person view set the standard for almost all racing games to follow. Outrun, Daytona, Sega Rally, Crazy Taxi and many more, right up to today's console games. These games are just a few of what I consider to be the most important games released during this golden age. They created and introduced a wide range of game genres and play styles and helped drive computer gaming out of the tech world and into everyday life. Without their contribution, the games we have today would not exist. If you lived through this period, I hope this brings back fond memories. If you didn't, then you really have to try out these games for real. If you can get to a computer game museum, please go. You can't beat the look and feel of a real arcade cabinet. If not, give emulation a go and turn your computer into your very own arcade machine. With this you can run the real code from the real arcade machines. So have a look at my gaming tutorials for full details on this and I'll put links in the description below. If you've enjoyed this trip into gaming history then please do give me a like and make sure you subscribe to my channel to get all of my other videos. So I hope to see you again very soon. Bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.